Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church, continuing our study in Ephesians chapter 1. We're actually looking at verses 3 through 14, which constitute a single paragraph. In the Greek text, it would appear that these verses actually constitute one sentence. The entire paragraph is Paul's summary of the blessings which Yahweh has graciously bestowed on the believer in order to manifest His glory. Now, these verses are in the form of a Jewish bracha. Rabbi Shaul is blessing Yahweh for all He's given us. He's just given a blessing here. And he's thanking the Lord for everything He has done for the believer. Now, when reading Paul, we need to keep in mind that he was a Torah-trained Pharisee who was adept at Jewish learning. Forgetting Paul's Jewish perspective can lead to misunderstanding his writings. Now, I have said that I believe that the whole New Testament was originally written in Hebrew. A lot of people have problems with that. I understand that. I didn't used to believe this. Um, but I do now. But let me just say this. Aside from the issue of what language the New Testament was originally written in, the primary question should be this. What language did Yeshua and His Talmudim speak when they were teaching? And I think the answer has to be Hebrew, and thus we need to understand the Bible from a Hebraic perspective. No matter when it got turned into Greek, it started Hebrew. That's my point. So we have to get a Hebrew mindset to understand what he's saying. Now last week we looked at verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of tres our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. Now implicit in the biblical doctrine of redemption is that God did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. We were enslaved to sin. We had no power, no means to free ourselves. God didn't need our help at all in doing this. In fact, it's an insult to Christ to think that we can add anything to what He did to redeem us. We can add anything to the price that was paid. And I think that's kind of a general thought in churchianity. Yes, he died on the cross for me, but if I got to help out a little bit, right? You got to do my part. That's right. You got to do your part. <laughs> Let's look at verse 8. It says, Which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. Now, the verse starts with which, that is, in which grace. It's going from that last verse to the riches of his grace. Which? He, he lavished this grace on us, he says. The word lavished here has the idea of superabundance, an excessive amount, overflowing measure. I think we can illustrate it like waves on the ocean. They just keep coming and coming and coming. They never stop. God's forgiveness is like that. For those of us who have been redeemed, the grace just keeps coming. Now, some scholars link the next phrase in all wisdom and insight with the preceding phrase, meaning that God gave us His wisdom and insight to understand our redemption and forgiveness. Or it may be seen as the Revised Standard Version puts it, to point ahead to the next blessing. That God has given us wisdom and insight to understand the mystery of His will or His plan for the ages. Verse 9 in the RSV says, For He has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of His will, according to the purpose of which he set forth in Christ. Now the words wisdom and insight here overlap in meaning. They constitute what grammarians called handiadis, which is a fancy Greek word that basically explains one through two. I don't really think this is Greek. I think it's Hebrew and it's a parallelism. You know, they'll use two words basically saying the same thing just with different words. You get one thought through the use of the two words. So the Greek word used here for wisdom is sophia. And to the Greek, wisdom is knowing some things. That's wisdom. You know some things. The Greek idea of wisdom, I think, could be understand, is the idea of wanting to understand the why of things. That's Greek. I, I want to know why. Like, let's say you're standing at the airport. 
And you're watching the planes coming and going. And you're thinking, why did they do this? And why, did they do this? why does he keep circling? You know, why did he not land right away? Why this and why that? And you, you, if you sit there long enough, you might be able to figure some things out. But you're not going to get too much. But if you go into the tower, with all the radar showing the visible location of every plane, and you hear the tower's communication with the planes, you'd learn a whole lot more. At once, you'd be able to look at the whole situation through the eyes of the men and women who were controlling the aircraft, and you'd see why the plane had to circle the runway before it lands. You would understand why the plane on the ground needs to wait for that clearance so long before it takes off. And you would understand why the plane stopped its taxing to return for repairs. The why and the wherefore of all these movements become plain once you see the overall picture. And that's a Western idea of wisdom. Understanding the why. But to a Hebrew, that's not what wisdom is. Wisdom doesn't consist of a deepened insight into the providential meaning and purpose of events going on around us. It's not the ability to see why God has done what He has done in a particular case and what He's going to do next. To an Eastern thinker, wisdom is like being taught to drive. What matters in driving is the speed and the appropriateness of your reactions to things and the soundness of your judgments as to what a scope a situation gives you. You don't ask yourself, why is this road so slippery? You just try to adjust to it and deal with it. You're not sitting there trying to figure out the why. Or why is this turn so sharp? You're not thinking that when you're going around it. You're thinking, oh my word, how am I going to, you know, what do I got to do to get around the turn? Or if you're driving down the interstate and someone stops in front of you, you don't sit there and think, I wonder why they all of a sudden stop dead on the interstate. You could care less why they stopped. All you want to figure out is how do I keep from running smack into the back of them? What do I have to do to deal with the situation? The why doesn't really matter. Instead of asking why, you simply try to see and do the right thing in that situation. See, to drive well, you have to keep your eyes focused to notice exactly what's going on in front of you. And to live wisely, you have to do the same thing. See, wisdom is properly evaluating circumstances and making the right decisions. It's the ability to respond correctly to the circumstances in life. In Hebraic usage, Wisdom described the individual who possessed moral insight and skill in deciding practical issues of conduct. It was a wisdom derived from his personal knowledge of Yahweh. Wisdom is not understanding the why. It's responding correctly to the circumstances of life. It's acceptance of and adjustment to Yahweh's revealed truth. Herbert Hoover once defined wisdom as knowing what to do next. That's the idea. You just know, how do I respond to this? Well, how do we get wisdom? Well, in Scripture, wisdom is inseparably, inseparably linked to fearing Yahweh. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So wisdom starts with the fear of Yahweh, and to the Hebrews, wisdom, as we said, is right living. It's responding correctly to life situations. So when you fear Yahweh, guess what? You begin to live right. You begin to respond correctly to the situations of life. Now this verse is a Hebrew parallelism. And the Hebrews love this. The Bible is full of these. Parallelism is the expression of one idea in two or more different ways. They're saying the same thing, they just say it in two ways. So if wisdom and understanding are parallel in this verse, and I believe they are, then fear of Yahweh and knowledge of the Holy One are also parallel. See, if we fear Yahweh, we'll walk in wisdom. And if we know Yahweh, we'll walk in understanding. To know Yahweh is to fear Him. To fear Him is to walk in obedience. Now, in our day, the idea of fearing God seems kind of old-fashioned to a lot of Christians. But there was a time not that long ago when to be called a God-fearing man or woman was a great compliment. You just don't hear that phrase used anymore. 
And I think the reason that there's so little wisdom in the church today is because there's so little fear of Yahweh. I mean, we've turned him into someone who's just there to meet our every need. Grant us every wish, right. It's a, he's a genie, Santa Claus, Easter Bunny all combined together, and he's just there to make sure you're as happy as you can be, no matter what you're doing or how you're living. And there's just no fear of the Lord anymore. We don't know him. That's the problem. And so therefore, there's no fear of him. Yahweh is holy, and He is to be feared. Now, I'm not talking about terror or dread here. I'm talking about a reverential awe that understands who He is and whose presence we are in. And I think the fear of Yahweh should provide a primary motivation for, as well as result in obedience to Him. See, if we truly reverence Him, we're going to want to obey Him. Since every act of disobedience is an affront to His dignity and His majesty and His name. Fearing Yahweh results in obedience, and this is wisdom. And like I said, it's not a fear that, well, if I disobey, then I'm going to get smacked. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you respect, you honor, you love Him so much that there's a fear that I might hurt Him. I might dishonor His name. Well, how can we come to really know Yahweh so we do fear Him? Well, I think there's only one way, and that's through a knowledge of Scripture which is Yahweh's self-revelation. He's revealed Himself to us in the Bible. The problem is, hardly anybody's read it. They just don't read it. They just hear it talked about, and so they believe what they hear, and they never go back to the book itself and find out what it says. A friend of mine got in an argument with some preacher over election. And he was asking, well, how well do you know the Bible? He said, I know the Bible like the back of my hand. I never understood that. I don't know the back of my hand all that well. You know, I'm like, I, you know, it's, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but it, you know, you know what he meant, right? And so, so my friend went to say, well, you know, the Bible says that he loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. And the guy said, the Bible doesn't say that. That's even in the New Testament. You think he'd at least know the New Testament, right? He, he was wanted to argue with him. The Bible doesn't say that. So he got out his Bible and he showed it to him. The guy packed up his stuff and he left mad. I'm not sure who he's mad at. God for putting that in there. <laughs> or, or my friend for telling him about it. But you know, people, we just don't know the book. And that's why it's so important that we spend time in it just reading it. Getting familiar with what, with what is in there. It's self-revelation. True wisdom for a man is adjustment to and acceptance of Yahweh's revealed truth. It lies in seeing himself as the creature in a right perspective to Yahweh, the Creator, and then acting accordingly. Paul says in Ephesians 1.9, He made known to us the mystery of His will. Now the word translated mystery here is the Greek word musterion. Talking about this word vine rights, in the New Testament it denotes not the mysterious, but that which being outside the range of unassisted natural apprehension can be made known only by divine revelation and is made known in a manner and in a time appointed by God and to those only who are illuminated by His Spirit. In the ordinary sense, a mystery implies knowledge withheld. Its scriptural significance is truth revealed. I think that's pretty good. Because that's what a mystery is. God is. It's something that before was not disclosed. It's being disclosed. You couldn't understand it in the past because it hadn't been revealed. Now it's being revealed and so you can understand it. The Greek scholar A.T. Robertson said that the Greek word mysterion, translated mystery, means this. Something that could not be known by men except by divine revelation. That's right. God didn't reveal it to them. But that, though once hidden, has now been revealed in Christ and is to be proclaimed so that all who have ears may hear. This Greek word, musterion, occurs 27 times in the New Testament, three of which are in the Gospels, where it's used in the same context in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's used four times in Revelation, and the remaining 20 times, all in Paul's letters, where it takes the form kind of a descriptor of the Gospel in its fullness. Now, Paul uses this word not to indicate a secret teaching, a rite or ceremony revealed only some elite initiatives, like as in the mystery religions, 
but truth revealed to all believers in the New Testament. That's what he's talking about here. In the general sense, the mystery is the unity of the cosmos under Christ. We're going to look at that in verse 10. Everything is put in its proper place in relation to Him. And in the specific sense, the mystery is the unity of the elect under Christ, Jews and Gentiles in one body, equally in Him. Now, let's talk again for a moment about the personal pronouns in this section. All right? Who is the us? And we talked about this. We said there's a lot of different views, right? Who is the mystery revealed to? Was it the Jews only? Was it the Jews at all? Or does it refer primarily to Gentiles here? Well, let's look at this. And Colossians 1.26 says, That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifest to His saints. So this mystery that has now been revealed to the saints was hidden in past generations. In other words, those prior to this time didn't know it. So the Jews didn't know this truth. That's the Old Covenant era and the Old Covenant people. They didn't know this. Now refers to the time of the writing of the New Testament. And so if we take it at the sense of what Paul was writing, maybe not even before AD 50 was the mystery really laid out, right? And what is interesting is that the word mystery in Paul's writings occurs in close proximity to the word stewardship. Paul associates those two words in seven out of its ten appearances in his own letters. Connects those two, mystery and stewardship. His stewardship, therefore, is seen to be tied up with the deliverance of the mystery. In other words, this is Paul's stewardship. He's delivering the mystery. We could almost say that's the sum total of what's been committed into his hands. Now, the Apostle Paul was the Apostle to who? The Gentiles. Look at Galatians 1.16. To reveal his Son in me, so that I might preach his name among the Gentiles. So Paul's got a mystery, and he's revealing this mystery to the Gentiles. And the mystery has to do with the Gentiles, according to Colossians 1.27, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So previously, God made His revelation to a theocracy, to the nation Israel. Now God is bringing His mystery to the Gentiles through Paul. That's His stewardship. So, because of that, It's hard for me to see how the us of verse 9 can be referred strictly to Jews. I think the us and the we of the first 10 verses refer to all believers, but then I think in verse 11 he changes. And we'll see that later, next week. I'll get into that in more more detail because I think it's, you know, 11, 12, 13, and 14 are really connected, and so we're going to put those verses together next week. Let's go on here now. It says, according to his kind intention which he purposed in him. The Greek here for kind intention, eudokia, and it means good pleasure. We've seen this word uh, back in uh, verse 5 when referring to God's good pleasure in predestining us to adoption as sons through Yeshua. Yahweh delights in all he does. You don't understand what I mean when I say that? There's never a time when he's constrained to do something. Do you delight in all you do? Huh? I was painting the other last week. I wasn't delighting at all. I hate painting. I was murmuring. I hate. <laughs> and my wife knew I had a bad attitude afterwards. She goes, this thing is a mess. <laughs> Who painted this? She said, Stevie Wonder? <laughs> and I said, yeah, she, you know, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, if Stevie Wonder was here, he'd have done a better job than I did. I, I mean, I just, I was in a bad mood. I didn't delight in it. I don't like painting. It's not that hard. You know, people say, I can't paint. Anybody can paint. You take a brush in the thing and you do like this, you know. And not anybody can do it well. <laughs> okay, I just, I don't. But see, Yahweh is never constrained to do something he doesn't want to do. He delights in everything He does. 
So guess what? If he chose us, if it, according to his kind intention, he purposed in him, he did it because he wanted to. It's his good pleasure. This is a glorious reminder of the sovereignty of God. He's watching over the universe that he created, and he takes pleasure in working in it. Never is he constrained. He does what he wants to do because it pleases him to do it. In other words, he does not determine his plan based on anything outside himself. That's a different God than most of churchianity believes in. It really is, but that is the God of the Bible. Most churchianity believes in a God who's up there and he's just he's rearranging the universe according to you. Because he just wants you to be happy, right? And he's there just for you. Look at Ephesians 1.10. It says, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ. Things in the heavens and things on the earth in him. The fullness of the times has the idea of the completeness or having reached the goal. I believe this is talking about the age to come. The consummation of all things. And people, the age to come is the age we live in. You say, well, how can we live in it if it's to come? It's not to come for us. It's to come for the Bible writers, okay? We live in a different time. I think you know that. We're 2,000 years separated. What they look for, we enjoy. The phrase, summing up of all things, comes from the compound Greek word, anokepholiami. And it means to sum up. The exact term which is translated summing up is found only twice in the New Testament. Both times it's used by Paul. The other use is found in Romans where Paul writes this in 13.9. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, it is summed up. In saying, summed up, the term used here means to gather up into one. In other words, all these commandments are gathered into one is this, love your neighbor as yourself. If you love your neighbor, are you going to commit adultery? No. If you love your neighbor, you're going to kill him. I don't think you love him if you kill him. And that's I, confusing to me. In the, that's a hate crime. Oh, do we have love crimes? What do you mean a hate crime? Of course, if you loved them, you wouldn't do it in the first place. Of course, it's a hate. every crime is a hate crime. Or it could be a love crime. You love yourself, so you do that. You, know? you shall not covet if you love your neighbor. So he says it's all summed up. It's a compound term with the principal root being for the word head. That's the, that's the root word here, head. And the purpose of God in history is to bring glory to himself by bringing all creation under the headship of Christ. He says things in heaven and things on the earth. This is a figure of speech that expresses comprehensiveness. God summing up all things in Christ. He's reconciling all things to himself, as Paul says in Colossians. Look at Colossians 1, 18-20. It says, and through him, referring to Christ, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. You can see the language is very similar to our text in Ephesians. He, he is also the head of the body. There's our, there's our root word. The church, and is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure, there's our good, His good pleasure again, for all the fullness to dwell in Him. Much of the same words, he's talking about the same exact thing. He says that Yeshua is the head of the body. It's the Greek word kephale. Especially in this context, and Paul's use of the term is the descriptor of Christ, that is of authority, of supremacy, of control. Christ. All things are summed up under the headship of Christ. It says he himself will come to have the first place. He is in the intensive here. It's autos, and it should be understood to mean he himself, he and no other. The idea is he alone has become preeminent. The Greek words from which we get first place is the Greek word prochuo. And Kittle defines it simply as to be first in rank. This preeminence is to be as wide in scope as it can possibly be. He is to be supreme in all respects and at every point. The fullness here refers to the fullness of God's plan of reconciliation. <coughs> Excuse me. In other words, Paul is declaring 
that the fullness of God's saving grace and provision of salvation resides totally in the work of Christ. Everything is being summed up in Him. In Ephesians 1.10, we see that Yahweh was behind the scenes, administrating history in accordance with His good pleasure for one reason, to bring everything under Christ. And we see here that the content of the mystery that has been made known is the summing up. It's summing up all things in Christ, bringing everything under the headship of Christ. We could say all that has happened in history is because of Christ. Why are you here today? Why are you on earth? It's because of Christ. Why didn't God kill Adam and Eve the moment they sinned? Because of Christ. Why did God save Noah and his family instead of wiping them out with the whole rest of the people? Because of Christ. Why did God choose a nation unto himself, give them his laws that he knew they could not keep, and even when they sinned against him, he didn't wipe them off the face of the earth? It was because of Christ. He is the summation, the climax of all human history. The summing up of all things in Christ. Now, some people want to use this verse as a defense for universalism. He's going to bring everything under Christ, things in heaven and things under earth. In other words, everybody's going to be saved. Well, we know from the rest of Scripture... We know from chapter 2 of Ephesians, where it talks about being children of wrath, that that's not the Apostle's meaning. He doesn't mean that everybody's going to be saved. The doctrine of universalism is not biblical. And maybe you make some people feel nice because they, they have invented a God who doesn't have wrath. He doesn't have anger. He doesn't have justice. He's just nice. And so therefore, universalism, they say God ever gets to be nice to everybody. And you just invented a God of your own imagination and you walked away from the God of the Bible. Because if you're familiar with the Scripture, the Tanakh is loaded with the justice, with the wrath of God. Read any of the prophets. It's amazing what God tells these people. If you don't do this, this is what's going to happen to you. Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and cursing. God is a God of love. The Bible says He's a God of love, but that's not His only attribute. You take that one, pick it out, get rid of all the rest. No, let's keep grace. Get rid of all the rest of the attributes, right? No, He's a God of justice. And therefore, wrath. He has to be just in all His dealings. All right, get off that one. Most commentators, which shouldn't be surprising to you, they view verse 10 as talking about the end of time, the end of human history, or what they call the eternal state. You familiar with that term, the eternal state? Eternal state is a, a term they use that means after the millennium, after everything, everybody just goes to heaven and it's the eternal state. There's no more earth. One commentator writes this, the summing up of all things in Christ is God's plan for human history. I agree. It is also the climax, the culmination of human history. I don't agree with that. It's not the culmination. Because see, this was talked about 2,000 years ago as a process. It was happening right then. And 2,000 years later, it's still not done? No, it's done. The New International Reader's Version translates Ephesians 1, 9, and 10 this way. He showed us the mystery of his plan. It was in keeping with what he wanted to do. It was what he had planned through Christ. It was all to come about when history had been complete. That's great translation up to that point. But see, they throw their bias in there. When history has been complete, this is the end of everything. So they see this happening at the end of time, listen, instead of at the end of the age. And all the Bible talks about the end of the age, it never talks about the end of time. The Bible doesn't mention the end of time because time doesn't end. Yeah, but the end was very near. The end that they were talking about, the end of the age, was very near at the time of the writing. Look what Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things. Now, if it's all things, then it would include Christ being made head of everything, right? The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. It was the end of old covenant Judaism. And Paul's talking about the end of the Jewish age and the consummation of the New Covenant Age. 
Now, he says in verse 11, in Him. Now, Paul begins with this, but the New American Standard Bible, it's at the end of verse 10. Remember, the verses aren't inspired. <laughs> Who is the in Him or in whom that Paul refers? Well, it's Christ from verse 10, the one in whom all things in the heavens and earth have been summed up in. See, throughout this eulogy, it's clearly seen that apart from our union with Christ, we have nothing. All of God's blessings center in and come from Yeshua the Christ and what He did on the cross. It's all in Him that He says we have obtained an inheritance. Now, I'll give you a little bit of, of why I said that I think the we here has to do with Israel in this text. The Greek word here, klerao, translated obtain an inheritance, occurs only here in the New Testament. Now, when you get a word that it's only used one time, then you've got go to you gotta go outside the Bible and see if that word's used there and try to get an idea of what the word's talking about. And you can get a, an idea of how confusing this can be by looking at the different translations. They're translated all kinds of ways. Literally, the word means to be chosen by lot. But since the verb is passive and there's no direct object, it's probably supposed to be rendered, most scholars feel, by the term chosen as God's inheritance. So we could render it this way, in whom we have also been chosen as God's inheritance. It's not that God gave us an inheritance, it's that we are His inheritance. That's the idea here. You see, Paul's not reiterating what he already said in verse 4, chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. I don't think he's going over that ground again. He is saying that whoever we may be, and again, I'll explain that next week. I think it's Israel. We're chosen as God's portion. Do you recognize this terminology as being chosen as God's portion? Look at the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32. For Yahweh's portion is His people. Jacob is the allotment of His inheritance. Now again, this is a parallelism. The expression of one idea, two or more different ways. Yahweh's portion is His people. Who's that? Jacob is his inheritance. So he is saying that Israel is his inheritance. I think that Paul's saying in verse 11, in whom we have also been chosen as God's inheritance, as Israel. They're his inheritance. I think the we here is referring to Israel. Paul's saying, I think the same thing here as he did in Romans 9, that the word of God has not failed. You know, you see in, in all these previous verses, 10 verses, he's talking about all the blessings that the Gentiles get, and he goes, wait a second, those blessings were promised to Israel. What's happened to us? Have the promises failed to us? And he says, no, they haven't failed at all. It's not all Israel who is of Israel. See, so he's saying the promise haven't fi failed, but what's with the promises they're only for, and he's going to clarify this in verse 10, they're only for the Israelites who have trusted in Christ. They are God's portion. He says, having been predestined according to His purpose. Talking about Israel, talking about His inheritance. You know what? Here, go, here goes Paul again bringing up this predestination thing. You know, you almost think he's a Calvinist. As we saw back in verse 5, the word means to decide beforehand. God decided beforehand. That's what the word means. There's no argument there. People will say, well, that's fine. It means to decide beforehand, but maybe that decision by God took into account my will and my desires. Now, hang on to this. I think that Yahweh did take into account your will and your desires when He predestined us for salvation. But the accounting He took was that our will is dead and trespasses and sins and our desire were only for those things that were ungodly would never lead us to Him. He took that into account and because of Yahweh's accounting of our will, He predestined us. He did all the work. Did you get that? In eternity past, Yahweh had a plan. Look at that. Line. According to His purpose. Whose purpose? His purpose. Who works. That's Him. He's working all things after the counsel of his own will. In other words, God purposed something, and then throughout eternity, he's working out what he planned in the past. That's how you do a plan, right? You lay out a plan, here's what I'm going to do, and then you work that plan. 
Except for us, it works differently, doesn't it? We lay out the plan and we fall on our face. The next, nothing goes the way we plan it. All right, it's not that way with God. God laid out a plan and he works the plan. Now again, the, object, the objectors try to say, they want to argue here, well, the all things, he's working all things? After the council was, well, that can't really mean all things. Because if it did, it would rob us of our free will. It would make God the author of evil. You know, some people say that catastrophes, such as earthquakes and hurricanes, are outside the all things of Ephesians. 111 here. See, they can't square these events with a loving God. You have a hurricane that kills people? That can't be God. We had a Bible study at the house, and we got into this one time with the man that was there, and he was saying, well, that's not a God. God doesn't do that stuff. And I took my Bible, and I said, well, look at here, look at here, look at here. look." At... God does all this stuff. I never saw him back at the Bible study again. Because that didn't fit the God he had invented. People, if you run across something in Scripture that ruins your view of who God is, then throw that view out and line up with Scripture. All right? Look at what Yahweh says to Zedekiah, who was king of Judah, and his officials, and the remnant of Jerusalem who remained in the land. God told Judah, listen to me. King Nebuchadnezzar is going to come. You go out there and surrender to him. Go, he's going to take you captive into Babylon. Do it. If you don't do it, here's what happens. I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence upon them until they are destroyed from the land which I gave to them and their forefathers. If you don't surrender to the king, you want to stay in there, you want to fight, you want to argue, you're going to get destroyed. I, I will send. God's very clear about this. Yahweh will send the sword. That's war. I will send famine. Well, famine's just happened. It's not anything God does. He wished they wouldn't happen, you know. But he just, what's he going to do? I will send the pestilence. That's a plague. They all come from Yahweh's hand because he controls all things. Now again, if that doesn't fit your view of God, then change. It's time for a, a paradigm shift. The Scripture clearly teach that God's sovereign will, listen, involves everything that takes place in life. All the events in time proceed from His plan. He laid a plan out in eternity past. He's working the plan. Absolutely nothing, nothing takes place by chance. Let me give you a couple of things that the Scripture reveal about the sovereign will of God. Number one, it's certain. God's will is certain. He works all things after the counsel of His will. The things that happen in life are simply the working out of what God planned from eternity. So God's sovereign will is certain. Look what Daniel says in Daniel 4.35. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, but He does according to His will. That's God. He does according to His will. In the host of heaven... And among the inhabitants of the earth, among the inhabitants of the earth, God does His will. And no one can ward off His hand or say to Him, what have you done? God has a plan. He's working the plan. It can't be frustrated by men, by angels, or anything else. You know, the sinner who wants to defy God's plan and shake his fist to the heavens, God determines how many times he shakes it. And whether he'll live to shake it tomorrow. God's will is certain. Secondly, it's exhaustive. This bothers people. How dare God be this big? Listen, God's will includes the germ as well as the galaxies. The fly as well as the pharaoh. The mosquito as well as the monarch. God determines... Who lands on Park Place? Some of you are familiar with the poem, For want of the nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of a rider, the battle was lost. For want of a battle, the war was lost. 
See, if God doesn't control the nails, then He can't control the wars. R.C. Sproul, in his book, The Sovereignty of God, said one of his childhood heroes, race car driver, was killed at the Indy 500 when he went around a turn and his car lost control because a 10-cent cotter pin broke. James said, if the Lord wills, we'll live and do this or do that. Not only are our lives under God's sovereign control, but so are our actions. You know, most people think, yeah, God controls the biggies. The big things in life, God controls. The little things, they're just left. Well, if the nail's left to itself, then the war is lost. Think about this. The fulfillment of any one prophecy requires God's control of the whole universe, lest something prevent its occurrence. We said the mosquito as well as the monarch. What if God chose some man to be a missionary, to do this great endeavor? He gets on the mission field and a mosquito bites him with malaria. He gets malaria and he dies. Then God goes, man, i got to go to plan B again. I hate these mosquitoes. You know, see how frustrated God would get? Judas and Pontius Pilate both had to be born at a certain time, didn't they? And therefore their parents had to marry at a given time. And this and many other conditions had to be carried out. And these conditions depended upon even more remote events. Take the prophecy of Genesis 15, 13. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. That's a prophecy. How's God going to carry that about? You're just going to hope things work out the way he wants them to? You keep his fingers crossed? <laughs> oh, I hope this works out. That's how we make things, right? We make plans. We say, well, I hope we can do this. Listen, God caused Jacob. Boy, people don't like that word caused when you talk about God. Get over it. God caused Jacob to migrate to Egypt to fulfill his prophecy. Was it possible for Jacob to will not to go to Egypt? God prophesied that he would go, so he's going. Can man's will prevent God's plans from coming to pass? No. It's, if it's beyond your paradigm to see that God controls men's will, consider this. Abraham moves south to Gerar in the kingdom of Abimelech. Abimelech becomes enamored with Sarah. That is one hot 90-year-old woman. Okay? And so he takes her for his own. He took her as part of his harem. Did he ever lie with her? Why not? He just said, she's really hot. I'm going to take her, but I'm not going to touch her. Why didn't he touch her? <laughs> Genesis 20, verse 6 says, Then God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this. I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. See, this king's all frustrated all night. Yeah, I got this beautiful woman I can't even get near. What's the problem? What's going on here? God said, I withheld you from sinning. I did it. He couldn't have chosen to do anything different because his will wasn't free. If God did not control men's will, how could he make a promise like this? Exodus 34, 23. Three times a year, all your males are to appear before the Lord Yahweh, the God of Israel. This is the pilgrim feast. Three times a year, where, no matter where you lived, you packed up your stuff, you went to Jerusalem for the feast days. All right? For I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your borders. Now watch this. No man shall covet your land when you go up the three times a year to appear before Yahweh, your God. So we're going to leave our town, we're going to leave our home, we're going to leave all our tent and our livestock and everything, and we're just going to go to Jerusalem. And we're not going to worry about anybody coming to take our stuff. Why? Because God said, no one will covet your land. And guess what? If they don't want it, they're not going to touch it. But he doesn't say, not only will they not take it, they don't even want it. They walk by, look at all, look at all that farm, look at all those sheep. Look. Ah, we don't want that. Let's keep going. And they're walking away, scratching their heads. Why don't we want that stuff? That's great stuff. It's real easy. Let's go take We don't even want it. You go to worship me, 
I'll take care of you while you're worshiping me. How does God do that? How does he pull something like that off? Controls man's will. God's sovereign will is exhaustive. He determines the president's personal plans. The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of Yahweh. He turns it wherever he wishes. I knew this verse from way long time ago, and I thought God controls kings' hearts. I just left it with kings. <laughs> you control the kings, you leave us alone. Well, if he controls the king's heart, he can control anybody's heart. You know, recently, when the decision was made not to attack Syria, I blessed Yahweh, who controls Obama's heart. I was thankful that we didn't enter into another conflict, but I didn't thank Obama. He wanted to desperately. His will was over, overruled in that situation. And God used a Russian to overrule it. I just thought it was all cool. <laughs> like, go Putin. <laughs> but I blessed Yahweh. We didn't need another conflict. Listen, God determines the number that comes up when the dice are thrown. Proverbs 16.33. The lot is cast into the lap. But it's, it's is the lot. It's every decision is from Yahweh. Every decision that comes up in the lot is from Yahweh. Yahweh, God rules people over the affairs of men. Look at Daniel 2.21. Let's back up here for a second. No, back up one more. There you go. The king's heart. I know. Sorry, guys, back there. <laughs> Listen. I think if we could all grasp the significance of this verse maybe lower the anger level, the stress level in our lives a little bit. It's sickening what's going on in our country, okay? The decisions this president makes, you're wondering, does he have half a brain? But listen, God is in control, okay? So rest in him. My personal feeling, it's a judgment. It's a judgment on America for its turning from God. There's blood, innocent blood shed in this land, a million and a half babies a year. This land is turning to homosexuality. This, tur this land is turning away from God. And I don't think God's just sitting back saying, oh, how sad that is. No, he is judging it. And people say, well, God's going to judge our country because of Obama. I think Obama is the judgment. Okay? <laughs> I really do. All right. Let's go to Daniel 2.21. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings. He establishes kings. We're going to vote pretty soon. Just keep this in mind. He removes, he establishes, he gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. God sets up who is in office. <laughs> I'll never forget. I, I don't know. How long, when was Clinton elected president? How long ago was that? What? 92. Okay, I don't know how old Lindsay was. But she was like eight, seven or eight, nine years old. And I remember going out that morning, I got the paper. And, you know, it talked about Clinton was elected president. I sat down at the table, and I was just grieved. I was tore up. You know, Lindsay says, what's wrong? I said, you know, president, you know. And she said to me, you know, Daniel says, God establishes kings and removes kings. I just sat there. I said, yeah, it does say that, doesn't it? You know, I mean, we, out of the mouth of babes, we need to be reminded, people, of those things. No one can act outside God's sovereign will or against it. Centuries ago, Augustine said this. Nothing, therefore, happens unless the omnipotent wills it to happen. He either permits it to happen or brings it about himself. Now, i got to say I disagree with Augustine here. I think the idea of permitting is not something you don't even use when you're talking about God. God doesn't permit things. He causes things. He controls things. It's not like he says, well, that's not what I want, but I'll permit it. No. We already saw it. God's pleasure is always carried out. He doesn't permit things. He rules. He calls all the shots. Why is that? Because he's God. That's one of the prerogatives of deity. The sovereignty of God is attested either expressly or implicitly on almost every page of the Bible. It's all about his control. And I think the Christian who has a mature understanding and trust in God's sovereign plan 
is spiritually prepared for anything in life. I really do. He doesn't understand why he had to endure some difficulty, but he, he knows that his God is sovereign and his God is an all-loving, caring Father with all wisdom. So all our why is this happening to me questions ultimately have the same answer because our loving God in his sovereign wisdom willed it to. Why? Some maybe we'll never know here. You know, in the book of Job, the Bible never says at the end that God explained to Job everything that happened to him. It doesn't say that. He doesn't explain anything to Job. He just reveals who he is to Job. And Job's like, okay, whatever. He doesn't explain, here's why I killed all your children. Here's why I took all your money. He doesn't do that. We don't see that in there. It's just he realized who God is and he bows, doesn't he? Now let's be honest. When circumstances don't go the way we want them to, the way we planned, we get usually pretty upset, don't we? Would you say that's true? You get upset when things don't go the way you plan them to go? Well, if we believe that God controls every event in time, if we believe that nothing happens apart from His sovereign plan, then why would circumstances upset us? Well, the answer is, we get upset because our will conflicts with God's will. All right, We don't like His plan. We want it our way. And people, this is not Burger King. You don't get life your own way. Okay? It's not only important that we live in obedience to God's moral will. He's laid His will out in the Word of God, and I think we are to submit to that will. Listen, it is also important that we live in submission to His providential will. You understand what I mean when I say that? His providential will? His providential will is whatever happens in time. You say, how do we submit to that? By saying, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu. Blessed be the Lord our God. In whatever situation. Because he brought it for a reason. We might not understand it. We will never understand it. Whatever it is that you're going through, you can be sure that your father has a loving purpose in it. We need to learn to submit to God's providential will even when we don't understand it. Most of the time you're not going to understand it. Most of the time you're not going to understand it. We've been talking about the Hebrew language and the Hebrew letters, you know, and the significance of the letters. I think it's a, it's the, it's a divine language. The very first letter in the Bible is what? Anybody know? Okay. You would think Aleph, right? It's not. Bait. Why? Because in, in the Bible, in their culture, everything revolved around the home. Everything. You want to understand love, you understand the love of family. Everything revolves around the home. And God is our loving Father. The protector, the provider. He's the one who cares for us. And He has brings things into our life because He wants them there for a purpose. Let me give you a biblical illustration of a man who submitted to God's providential will at great pain to himself. Eli was the high priest of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 3, we know how God revealed to the young child Samuel he's about to kill Eli's two sons for their sinfulness. Now Samuel probably didn't like that message too much. i got to deliver this message? So the next day Samuel communicates this message to the aged priest and it's difficult to conceive of a more difficult message for a parent to receive. The message that his children are going to be suddenly killed under any circumstance would be a great trial for any father. Yet this is the message to Eli. What is Eli's response when he receives these words from Samuel? He says, it is Yahweh. That puts everything in context. This is the self-existent one. This is the God of Israel. It is Yahweh. Let him do what seems good to him. Holy mackerel. Can you imagine someone coming to you and saying, I got a prophecy for you. Your children are going to be killed. God's going to kill your children. You'd be pleading with God, begging with God. You know, God, dude, plead. 
Eli, it's Yahweh. Let him do what seems right. That's submission, people. He knew Yahweh, and he trusted him. He didn't argue. He didn't try to talk him out of his plan. He simply bowed to Yahweh's sovereign will and humble trust. When is the last time things went contrary to what you wanted, and you said, it's Yahweh. Let him do what seems good. Job's response is very similar. He said, naked came I from my mother's womb. No one wants to argue with that, right? Naked I shall return thereof. You're going to die with nothing. You came with nothing. Yahweh gave. Yahweh has taken away. Now, I dare say most of churchianity would have a real problem with that. They don't have a problem with Yahweh giving. But it says, Job, you know what Job's doing right there? His ten children just died. He lost all his financial assets. And guess what? He's blaming it on God. The Lord has taken away. Yahweh took it away. Church would go, oh, God doesn't do that kind of stuff. He only does good things for us. It was a good thing for Job. It brought Job to a face-to-face -face awareness of God. Here's what Job says. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. In the loss of his ten children, he bows the knee in, su in humble submission and blesses Yahweh. Do you think he had a working relationship with God when circumstances that hard come to pass? I mean, we're not talking about he got a flat tire on the way to work. His air conditioning broke at his house. He lost his job. He lost all his financial assets and then his ten children all at once were wiped out. And he says, Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. In all of life, people, in every circumstance, we are called to bless Him. Because He is holy. And He is ruling. He is in control. And He's ruling for His glory and our good. Let's pray. Abba, we thank you that you are a loving, caring, wise Father who knows way more what we need than we know. And we thank you that you are in control of every and all circumstances in life. Lord, I pray we would come to bow before you in humble submission as Job, as Eli, bowing the knee, blessing you for who you are. Lord, I pray that we would come to know you from your scriptures in such an intimate way that life circumstances would only cause us to bow the knee in blessing to you. Amen.